my Father. Father, all creation groans for your coming. Father, until that time, I pray that we will continue to give you the praise and the worship, Father, because you are the one. Father, without you, none of us would have a hope. Without you, Father, we wouldn't be able to move forward. Without you, Father, we wouldn't be able to return to that beautiful paradise that you created before our time. Father, thank you for coming into our world, picking us up, meeting us at the cross, and now, Father, taking us back home. Father, there's many that will go home before us, do, but Father, please let us remember that we'll join them. Father, one day, all this will go away. Father, we'll be with you at that beautiful eternal place, worshiping and loving in a way like we've never experienced before. Till then, Father, may we keep our heads in your word and our feet in your path, that we can walk worthy in a way, God, that shows the world the light of hope, which is who you are. For us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I have a strong urge this morning just to tell you, God loves you. He deeply, deeply loves you. He loves you in a way that you don't even have to worry about doing anything. He just loves you just like you are, where you are. You don't have to do anything to earn His love. Jesus loves you. It's like a mother looking at a child saying, you've got to do X, Y, and Z to love me. You don't look at that child like that. That child has your love 100%. If you don't get anything else today from this message, and you may not, but I hope you do. <laughs> Jesus loves you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And there is no condemnation in you because you are of Christ. You have His righteousness. I'd love to have each one of you operate from that position. Tomorrow morning, when you wake up, I don't want you trying to figure out if you're loved or not. Just as you start off in the morning, just know you're loved and see what your day will look like. Just wake up knowing you're loved. That Jesus gave his life and there that arose from the grave and loves you. And just from that point on, know that you don't need a value from anyone else. You don't need to give your ownership papers to anyone to determine who you are. That you are absolutely 100% a child of God and loved by him. What would that feel like? What would that look like? You see, James has got the new church in Jerusalem set up. God gave him the church. Jesus Christ is the head of that church. And James is trying to help transition from one religious system to a system of New Testament grace. He has the church temple over here, the temple, and they're starting the rituals. They're trying to do their works towards their salvation, so to speak. And never get there. They had grace also, but they're doing rituals and working, washing seven times, going through the law. And James is over here in the church saying, Stop it. We have a New Testament now. We're under the grace of Christ. All that is done away with. I reside in my heart now. The law is upon your heart. It's not only outward anymore. You're still saved by grace through faith, but you no longer have to do the sacrificial system because the Lamb of God has been slain in the altar. And he is risen from the grave and now is ascended into the heavens at the right hand of the Father. And James is trying to tell them, live your life that way. Quit trying to take on the role of God. Stop. Quit trying to figure this out. In fact, he says, as we saw last Sunday, the problem that he presents is you and me playing God. And number one, he's saying, quit playing God in the life of others. And he says, don't speak against God evil with each other. Dear brothers and sisters, if you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. Oh. And by the way, you're criticizing and judging a child of God. Do you moms like it when anyone judges your child in front of you? Wow. I pity the fool that judges my wife's children in front of her. And James continues and says, but your job is to obey the law and not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone who gave the law as a judge. He alone has the power to save or destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbors? But today we're going to be looking at a different role of playing God. 
This is us playing the role of God in our own lives. Forget about the others. Let's talk about it in our own life. James starts out in 4, 13 through 17. It says, this is what it looks like when you and me are playing God over our own lives. He says, James says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and will make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow, says James. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. See, the first negative response to God's will is foolishly ignoring it. Living as if God does not exist or was uninterested in your human behavior. He cares about every turn and every thought that you have. He made you. He loves you. He wants all of you. I want you to see how James addressed the church in this passage right here. He uses an old, familiar Old Testament prophetic style. Look at me with this. Isaiah 1 through 16. You'll see it. Isaiah says, wash your hands and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Help the oppressed. Defend the cause of orphans. Fight for the rights of widows. You think James has read this somewhere before? Because we see that even in his letter, don't we? Then he continues on. Here it is. Come now. Let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them white as wool. Can I tell you your sins have been paid for? The penalty of your sin is paid for and you are now white as wool and you are white as snow. When your Lord looks at you, He sees you cleansed from the stain of sin. There's none. He sees you whole. He sees you in your beauty because His Son covers you in righteousness. So now you're a friend of God. See, James, his words are an insistent calling for attention. He's telling the church, listen to me, come on now, let's get this settled. Let God be the role provider in your life, not yourselves. You see, they also indicate disapproval for the conduct they're exemplifying. So James is kind of rebuking his church, but he's doing it in a loving way. He's not doing it to try to make them conform to a standard that's going to hurt them. He's doing it so they will do something that will lovingly walk and please God and their joy will be made complete. James is in effect saying, listen up church, get this. You see the phrase appears only here in James 5.1 in the New Testament. See, the target of James' review are those listed in verse 13 who say this, today or tomorrow we will go do such and such and such and such city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. James knows there's not one part of this that was said. They said, let's go talk to God first and see what He thinks about this. You see the Greek text literally reads, the ones who are saying, and that's the one James is talking to, <laughs> indicating the people who eventually live without God's desires are without God's input into their life. It also means it's logic that they're using to not use godly wisdom. They're using only their wisdom and not God's. James reprimanded those who have to habitually think through and articulate their plans of God as though he does not care or exist about what they're doing. In the church, God cares about every breath you take. He's intricately woven into your life. You see, you're, you're made in his image. You represent the King of Kings. It's amazing, too, because it's a specific illustration that James chose was one that would have been familiar to the readers at that time. You see, many of the Jews were dispersed throughout the ancient world, and they were very successful businessmen, wandering merchants, who naturally sought out the flourishing trade centers within which to do business within the cities. You see, wise planning and strategizing in business is not, of course, sinful in itself. It is not sinful in itself. What sinful is not seeking God's will in what you're doing. He created you. He made you. He knows what's best for you. You see, that was our problem in the garden. I know we weren't there, there before Adam and Eve were there. You see, they wanted their way. They wanted to be done the way they wanted to do things. They weren't looking in God's way. They wanted to experience evil and decide for themselves what was good or bad. God says, no. 
you do life with me, I'll decide that. And they partook of the fruit. And the first thing they did in shame was went and hid themselves. Don't hide from God. He knows where you are. Don't create something to think that you can get along with Him. He's already created the one to help you get along with Him. And that was His Son, Jesus Christ. And then He came and gave you the Holy Spirit. When Jesus left to go back to the Holy Spirit, is to guide you and direct you in your life. To help convict you in areas that you don't go down the wrong path. You see, God's got the way. You've got the map. And the map will lead you to joy in the most difficult times in your life. See, no spiritual principles were violated by anything the businessman said. The problem was lying in what they did not do. They did extensive planning, but in the course of their planning, they totally ignored God. God was not a part of their agenda. I pray that God's a part of your agenda in your daily walk. <laughs> I pray the first thing you do when you wake up is know that you're loved. And you ask, Father, what do we have today? Father, I've got to go to my job. I realize that. Father, I've got to go to my job. But Father, bring those by that you've planned before the foundation of the world that I can meet. Father, help me not become part of the event that's going on. Let me stay out of the event. Father, let me usher you into where that is. And I want to join you there. Father, help me not become part of the problem. Father, help me be the solution. Let me be the solution. And by the way, you are the solution. You're the light of hope. You're the light of the world. I love what a young man did a while ago. He came up and talked to Robin. He said, I don't know what to tell you. He said, basically, but I care. That's the most wonderful thing you can tell somebody. We don't have all the answers. God does. And He'll reveal those to us in His time. You see, many of us assign Him control over certain tasks, keeping the daily and commonplace tasks for ourselves. I can handle those things. God becomes the boss of religious issues, the moral issues, matters, but we'll handle things like finances, relationships, we'll handle the business decisions. You see, we think those things God can care less about as long as He has our hearts. He cares. May I encourage you to see that God knows it all? He can handle all of your life. Give it all to Him. I ask myself a question. Where in the world did I ever get the idea that I am the master of my own destiny? What idiotic thought put that in my mind that I think I can control my life? I'm nothing but a rambling wreck until God showed up. Now He's having me walk down a path. Are you kidding me? Put me here? Are you? Do you know what you're doing? He says, yes, I do. Yes, sir. Let's just keep on walking. You think I deserve to be here? You think, are you, no. I deserve death and hell and damnation. But because the Christ in me says, no longer do you, because you've accepted my Son, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, now you can walk in the fullness of Him. Now let me direct your life and guide your ship. I'll be the sails that take you along. Just follow me. Get your hand out of the bucket, my I'm doing the bait and the fishing for you. You'll catch a lot more that way than you will on your own. You see, the philosophy of the person who plays God in his own life has phrases like, you pull himself up by his own bootstraps. You call your own shots. I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. The rules for taking over God's role in your life is found in James 4.13. We break it down step by step. Rules for playing God, according to James. Number one, set your own schedule, today or tomorrow. Select your own path. We'll go to such and such a city. You place your own limits and spend a year there. Arrange your own activities and spend a year there. And also, predict your own outcome and we'll make a profit. Again, none of these activities that James is describing is negative in or of itself. There's nothing wrong, I said, with planning ahead. There's nothing evil about setting a schedule. There's nothing bad about engaging in a business. And there's nothing sinful, hear me, about making a profit. Last time I checked, keep the lights on. You've got to make a profit somehow, some way. Nothing evil about that. In fact, James describes your everyday life, affairs, and normal life. But it's precisely his point is because God is our sovereign Lord, we must consider his desires for us in every aspect of our life. 
does God desire for your heart? Have you ever just sat down, Lord, place your desires in my heart. Make your way my way. Father, take my desires away. My desires are selfish. My desires many times are conceited. Father, what are your desires? James begins pointing out the problems we will encounter with a go-it-along attitude toward life in verse 14. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. There's three things here. First of all, as mere more humans, you and I have no idea what the future will bring. We don't know what will happen today, much less the next year or two, what that will look like. Every one of us Every one of us is a heartbeat away from passing on, literally, to be with our Lord and Savior. You have no guarantee. One expected, unexpected event could put an end to all your plans. We could live into our 90s. My mother, 94 years old. Or we could pass away tonight. Nobody knows. Only God knows. And that 94 years my mother lived seems like a snap of the finger. Number two, playing God with our own lives is risky because we have no assurance of a long life. James describes our life as what? A vapor that appears suddenly and it dissipates and goes away. Doesn't happen very often in Phoenix, but sometimes when you can go outside and you can see your breath and you can exhale on a cold winter day, what happens? Your warm breath forms a small puff of white vapor that lingers for a second. And guess what? It matters what you do here where you're going. It matters. Let your light shine. Before you know it, poof, it's gone. The labor dissolves and life happens fast. Number three, we have no right to ignore God's will in any aspects of our lives. In James 4.15, he tells us how to correct ourselves and allow God to walk us in the path he has designed for us to go. Look at this. James 4.15 Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live, we will also do this, and we will do that. That's a beautiful phrase. If the Lord wills, brothers and sisters, we will go far and we will do this, and we will do that. Everything we do depends on what the Lord wills. James' instructions say that the Lord's will reflects an attitude and an orientation towards our life. It means substituting ourselves, submitting ourselves humbly before the one true God who is entitled to be Lord of all things in our lives, not just a few things. God governs all things, even the mundane daily decisions. Brothers and sisters, He owns it all. Give it to Him. Give up your way. Give up your desires to His. We can see the alternative is submitting all things to God in verse 16. Look at verse 16. But as it is, says James, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. That pride's a bad deal, isn't it? Pride sure gets out of our way. It makes me think I'm really something apart from God. Back in Texas, we say, that's all that in a dip of snuff. I don't know if a dip of snuff goes, but that's all that in a dip of snuff. I guess that just tops it off and sends you higher. I don't know what it is. But as it is for you, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. This is living life as if we are the masters of our own fate or the captains of our own souls. Let me ask you a quick question, by the way. How's that working for you? not working too well many times, is it? We have to stop, get out of the event. God, where are you in this? Because if I can't find you, I'm going to go crazy because I'm trying to control this thing and the outcome's not coming out the way I want it to be. Back up. Let God have the event. Father, where are you working in this? That I can walk with you and we can be the light that's needed to shine in this darkness to help someone out of the troubles they're in. Mainly me. Mainly me. We need to reappraise things, take a new look through the paradigm of God's 
eyes to see what it looks like with Him. We see the passing of our loved ones. What does that look like to God? Then His glory, He's got His child with Him, and they're loving and they're singing the praises together, worshiping the King of Kings. What does it look like to a parent whose child is losing his eyesight? How do you find the glory of God in that? One day those eyes will be restored to more than 2020. Until then, God, who are you working in the lives of those around that we can join, that we can spread your gospel message in a way that gives you honor and glory if this wouldn't have happened? Take the difficult times in your life, and I know it's not easy. Turn them around and see how God looks at them. Let Him help you through it. He's there. He will not leave you. James concludes verse 17 by pointing out two ways to stop playing God in our lives. I love the practicality of Scripture right here. Look at this in verse 17. Therefore, look at some of this. To the one who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it, to him is sin. So what's he really saying? First, know the right thing to do, then start doing it. Pretty simple, isn't it? You get her done. That's what we call it. I can't tell you times I've heard that. Working on a ranch over there. What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? Just get it done. We got to go eat supper. You know what to do. Go get it done. Doesn't matter if it's raining. It doesn't matter what it is. Go get the job done and get back home because we got to eat. I don't know what the eat part of that was. Maybe been hope or encouragement. But I tell you what, there's a lot of things that were unleft, that were done, that were left undone. I promise you, they wait in the morning. Look, God wants to guide us along the path He set for us. Ephesians 2, 9 and 10. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast. For you are His workmanship. You were created in Christ Jesus for these good works, which God prepared beforehand so that you would walk in them. It's already set for you. It's completed. It's a finished work. Don't you dare let the darkness of this world overcome the light that's in you. It's impossible for it to in the first place. Stay in the walk of God. Let the light shine from you to others. Don't let the darkness come in. Be a shining light. Look, you were created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared beforehand so you would walk in them. To make this happen, we need to stay close to His Word, allowing His Word to shape our path according to His wisdom. James says you need wisdom. Ask God. He will give it to you plentiful. Walk in faith. Ask God. Don't be double-minded. In the broadest sense, God's will is expressed in all these commands and the principles of Scripture. I want to give you some specifics of God's will. Specifically, the Bible says that God's will is this. Number one, 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. God's will is this. This is good and acceptable in sight of a God, our Savior, who desires, heavy world desires, all men and women to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. That's what God desires. He also desires that we be spirit-filled. Number one, God desires that you come to Him and know Him as your personal Savior through Jesus Christ, His Son. The next desire is He desires you to be Spirit-filled. He says, making the most of your time because those days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand that what the will of God of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody with your heart to the Lord. You know you're walking with the Spirit when you're doing these things. In church, we did these things this morning. That's when the desires of your heart are matched up with the desires of God. Always giving thanks for all things. I did say a few things, all things, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, God even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. That fear doesn't mean be scared of God. That means in the reverence of Christ. I don't know what it looks like or how it's supposed to turn out, but I thank God that my brother passed on at that period of time. I don't understand it. All glory be to God. He's the creator. He is sovereign. He knows what he's doing. I don't. 
All I know is He's planned for me to walk with Him. He planned before the foundation of the world. And I'm choosing the best of my ability to choose to walk with Him. And I have a wife that helps me do that. Thank God. She does. She's my helper. She absolutely has the authority in my life to tell me when she sees something wrong. And I love her for doing that. Because she wants me to become more like Christ so she can help follow the God of her heart too. We need friends like that. We need church like that. God's will says He wants you to be saved. He wants you to be spirit-filled. Number three, be sanctified. That means grow in Christ. For this is the will of God. Your sanctification, that is, abstain from sexual immorality. How clear is that? That each one of you know how to possess his own vessel in a sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So, he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit. <clears throat> he wants us to be submissive. That's his will. Submit yourselves, 1 Peter 2, 13 and 15. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king or one authority, or to his governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. He talks about suffering also. God's will is also involving suffering. For it is better, 1 Peter chapter 3, 17, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. It makes sense, doesn't it? The person obeying these five aspects of God's will, look at what the Bible says. The five I just gave you, look what Scripture says about the person that's trying to obey those. Look, there's enough grace given to you to do those things, even if you do a couple of them wrong. God's grace is sufficient for you. Look at this, Psalms 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. What's your heart desire? This means He will both plant desires, and then He will fulfill them. Father, give me the desires of your heart. Give me an understanding of having joy as though I walk through the most difficult things in my life. Father, your presence is so needed and I know you're there. Father, have me return to that joy that only you can give. Father, look, have me look to the hope of what's there that it will surpass all of the things going on here that I know that one day all this will go away. Let me hang on to the hope which is a promise you said I will inherit regardless of the events happening down here that one day I will be with you face to face. There will be no more tears, you will be more crying, no more trouble, no more anguish. Everything will be okay. When we know what God wants from us, we need to do it. If we continue to live as though God is interested in certain areas of our lives, James says what? It's sin. Look, that's the point of James' final warning. Know the right way, then humbly submit to it. And I'll close on this. Those who know God's will are responsible to obey it, and if they fail to do so, God will lovingly discipline you to get back on the right path. Lovingly discipline you. What comes to my mind in this process is, does anybody remember the wayward prophet Jonah? He provides a classic illustration of one who knew the will of God but refused to do it. He even heard the words of God from the mouth into his ear. Look at this. God called by God to preach at Nineveh. The reluctant prophet instead attempted to flee to Tarshish. That's about an opposite direction that you could possibly go. God says go this way. He went that way. And in that process, Jonah found himself in the belly of of a fish. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Symbolic. Three days, three nights. Jesus Christ. Death. Resurrection. Only after being lovingly disciplined by God <coughs> did Jonah finally submit to his will. Let me read this. 
Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. Yeah, he goes to praying too. And he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for the help from the depth of the Sheol. Your voice, you heard my voice. For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows, they passed over me. And so I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Look at this. Nevertheless, I will look again towards your holy temple. What have God just told you? Don't worry. I'm still here. I'm just bringing you back home where you need to be. Your child that runs off, or if you were a child that ran off, you tell your child to God, he'll bring you back home. The love of your Heavenly Father will always give you the opportunity to get out of where you're in and bring you back home. I like how he delivered him in Jonah 2.10. Then the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up on the dry land. Got him out of it, still had the sticky stuff all over him, got himself cleaned up. So my question to you today then also is this. <clears throat> what kind of fish has got you swallowed up? What's got you? Do what you want to do. Look back to the Holy Temple. The only thing you have to do is look inside your heart because you know where God resides right now. In your heart. His Son, Jesus Christ, lives in your heart. And the Holy Spirit's there also. You are the temple of God. You have to look nowhere. Go look in the mirror. You're looking at the temple of God. This is the dwelling place of your Lord. He lives right here. Right here. 24-7 you have access to Him. He never sleeps nor slumbers. He's there. Don't be afraid to call upon the Lord. And if your prayer is only, say only, Lord, give me desires of your heart and mine. Because that's what I want to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Father, thank you that you haven't abandoned us. That you've given us a man, Father. It's your word. Father, it's instructions on how to live your life while we're here on earth through us and from us, Father. Father, help us to cling to you, Father. Father, reminds me to cling to the old rugged cross. Father, help us clean, designing ourselves and our desires, taking on your desires. Father, let this be a church of yours that sin <coughs> understands that out of love we will do all things. Help us, Father, to love you in a way, Father, that we truly understand that there's nothing we have to do that we are totally loved. Father, I don't have to worry about doing anything. I'm loved. But Father, out of that love, I want to do things. And Father, when it comes from love, it truly praises and gives you glory, Father. And that's our, that's our system, Father. We want to glorify you. Father, I want to glorify you with all that you give us, Father. I pray, Father, that you'll have us all, every part of us. Father, our finances our emotions, our feelings, Father, our everything that we've got, Father, is yours. Father, we love you. Of course, in Christ's name I pray. Amen.